All right, praise the Lord. We had some great, great worship music here, uh, and we're just we're just thrilled to be in the Lord's house today. Amen. Amen. Well, today we want to first of all welcome our Facebook friends and our, pr our friend from uh, YouTube, and uh, we are so thrilled that that you you decided to uh, join us uh, through these means, and so we are going to. Um, I think we're going to finish. I'm not going to uh, fully commit to that because, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll touch base with my Lord and Savior and see if he wants me to move on to something else for next week. But um, so far, I believe that today will be the last sermon uh, on stewardship, uh, on this series of stewardship. And we're going to be talking about safeguards, uh, safeguards of stewardship, safeguards of stewardship. You see, many who followed Jesus in his earthly ministry did so for the wrong reasons. They simply longed for the thrill of witnessing miracles. They failed to recognize Jesus Christ as God's messenger and their personal savior. But folks, many folks today accept Jesus Christ as savior but they fail to understand the responsibilities of stewardship. Some believers today who have understood it have drifted away from it, from stewardship we're talking. People have said, I used to believe this or that. Maybe you've heard somebody say that. I have heard people tell me, well, I used to believe this or I used to believe that, but not anymore. So I ask, what has happened? I'm afraid that they have a lot of other influences or, or things to change their thinking. So today, I want us to remember, I want to remind you of some things that will safeguard, Lord willing, they will safeguard our perspective on stewardship. If we are to be good and faithful stewards, we must not lose our stewardship perspective. So this is the way I intend to, to, to close this long series of messages. Uh, if I have counted correctly, today will be number six. And I have four points that I want us to cover today. First of all, fear God. Second of all, or second is uh, be content. And then trust God. And last but not least, be watchful. And we're going to be looking at two um, passages or two uh, parables, um, more passages than two, trust me, but, but two parables. And we're going to look at, at teachings from Jesus himself uh, on, on this and, and hopefully and prayerfully we'll be able to, uh, to understand how we can safeguard our stewardship. Amen. Let's go Lord in prayer. Lord, again, we come before you thanking you for a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to gather here and, and to worship your name and study your word. And we ask you that as we do so, that you would guide and direct us. And Lord, open our hearts that we may understand uh, the teachings from your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fear God. Folks, fearing God is a key to wise stewardship. In Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, we find that it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Folks, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's very, very important to our understanding of our stewardship responsibilities, folks. We need to fear the Lord. And let's look at a parable of the rich man in Luke chapter 12. And I want us to read verses 16 through 21. Luke 12 verses 16 through 21 it says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have not, I have no room where to bestow all my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull, uh, pull down my barns and build greater, greater barns, that is. And there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, look at how prideful this guy was. Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine 
Take that ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20 says, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? In verse 21, he said, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There's a lot of, a lot of material here. And we're not going to go in depth in this, but we'll be we'll be going back and forth to this uh, parable uh, here for the next few minutes. But folks, we find in, in the parable of a man, uh, in this parable, we find a man who had an abundance of possessions, obviously. And to him, life was a matter of eat, drink, and be merry. Apparently, that's all he cared for. Let's have fun. Eat, drink, and be merry. Self-satisfaction, self-indulgence. Sounds like today's world to me. So what did he do? He spent his days providing for himself. But worst of all, he forgot about God. Jesus said the rich man was a fool, as is anyone who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. An awesome, awesome respect for God safeguards our stewardship perspective. The rich man in this, in this parable evidently lost, if he ever had, that perspective. I guess he never knew or he never understood that everything he had was God's, which is stewardship 101, as I have said many times. Point number two here today is be content. The first one was Fear God. The second is be content. God instructs his stewards to be content with godliness along with food and raiment. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, if you go with me, it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we cannot carry, uh, excuse me, we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So like the man in the parable, some people never have enough. It seems like some people just never have enough. No matter how much they earn, no matter how much they consume, they always want more. Like the guy in this parable that we read. They are, as the Apostle Paul put it, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19, I think I have it there as well. Apostle Paul put it like this. People whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. That's sad, isn't it? And you know what is even more sad in my humble opinion is that this is the world that we're living in today. I mean, some of these verses, like Paul, you know, he wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit over 2,000 years ago, about 2,000 years ago. But for you and I, we look at this and it's like, yeah, that sounds like, yeah, that sounds like my Instagram, you know, the stuff I follow, yeah, that's what I see. Yeah, that looks like my Facebook. Yeah, that looks like whatever social media you have. Yeah, that looks like what our friends and neighbors and some relatives and, you know, what we see out there, our co-workers and whatnot. That's, that's life today. And the worst part of it is we think it's normal. I mean, it is normal, but it's still upside down. It's still messed up. It's still out of God's will. We can never find satisfaction in life unless we've learned contentment. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11 he said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You see, being content has nothing to do with how much I have or how much I lack. It's a state of mind, it's a state of your heart to be content, to be thankful. Contentment with God's provisions will protect our stewardship perspective. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, the writer says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have for he hath said 
talking about the Lord, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Folks, that should be sufficient. The promise that God will always be with us and that he will always look after us should be enough. Amen? Because he will provide all our needs as long as we're faithful to him. Then that brings me to my third point here today. Trust God. That is an awesome, awesome way to guard or safeguard our stewardship. Trust God. You know, again, thinking about this parable that we read a few minutes ago, this rich man apparently was caught up in worrying about his material possessions. Now think about it. He was worried about stuff that had not happened yet. He had, he had had a great, great year to the point that he's thinking, oh my gosh, where am I going to store everything? All the fruit of, of my labor and everything. Where, where are we going to store this? Oh, I know. Let's tear down the barns, build bigger ones. We'll store it there. But apparently it was so much that he said, now I can just take it easy relax. In other words, retire. Nothing wrong with retirement. But his mentality was I'm just going to eat, drink, party. Right? Do nothing good for anybody. I'm just going to, you know, indulge myself in everything that I want to do under the sun. But see, he believed that he had life by the tail because he had achieved financial independence for the foreseeable future. But he didn't know what was around the corner, as I have said many times. He was trusting in his assets rather than in his maker. But folks, for the believer, worry means that we're not trusting in God. You see, we gotta be careful with that. Being careful is one thing, but being worried is another. So trust in God. We are admonished to live by faith. You see, living by faith allows us to avoid the anxiety of wondering if we will have enough. As much as it seemed like he was going to enjoy the rest of his life, it was all based on worry. He was just worried that something would go wrong. And that's why he wanted to be very careful with what he had. But see, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything and by, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God. Worry limits our perspective to the range of our own ability and keeps us from seeing life in the context of God's care. Folks, when we worry, we're not trusting God. We're taking things in our own hands. We're taking matters, matter in our own hands. It's like, okay, what is it that I can do? In something that is, is, is beyond our power, then we worry about it. <coughs> what does that mean? We're not trusting God. But folks, that's exactly where God wants us to be sometimes. You know? In a place where, you know, we cannot control What's going to happen? So we have to trust in Him. Amen? Worry is a sin, folks. Simply put, worry is sin. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, for yet, uh, nor yet for your body. What ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? And then in Luke chapter 12 and verse 22, after that, uh, that parable of the rich man, he said uh, unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. Now, folks, Jesus was obviously not teaching. Or he wasn't obviously teaching his disciples to be irresponsible. All right? Jesus was not teaching them to not care and to just be responsible. Don't, don't have a job. Don't have a profession. Don't work. Don't do nothing. 
No, he, that's not the message here. That's not what Jesus was teaching. He was teaching against worry, which is completely different. We can overcome worry through acquiring attitudes that encourage good management for our material possessions. You see, humility that admits everything belongs to God. That's, that's a great uh, asset to have, humility that admits everything belongs to God. Contentment with our wages and circumstances. And by the way, I, I want to stop you for a second. Contentment doesn't mean that you are just doing nothing about progressing or about the future or about, about wanting you know, to better yourself or your family. Satisfaction with God's supply of our necessities. Determination to persevere in our efforts to progress or to progress. Uh, Galatians 6 and verse 9, I think I have it there. Yes. And let us not be weary. This is a very, very powerful verse. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. There is room for progression, folks. There is room for progress. There is room for improvement, obviously. God wants you to go from victory to victory, from glory to glory. Amen. If we faint not, he says that in due time, if we continue in well-doing, we will reap what we sow in his time. Okay? So trusting God safeguards our perspective as his stewards. We are his stewards. We're his managers. All right? Now, the last point is be watchful. Be watchful. And there's another um, parable that I want us to look at in Luke chapter 12 as well, but look at verses 36 through uh, verse 40. Luke 12, verses 36 through verse 40. It says, And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocked or knocketh he, that, that they may open unto him immediately verse 37 says blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find what watching watching not as in watching TV like a lot of people oh, I, I'm watching no that not, it's not talking about watching TV it's waiting diligently. He said, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, that's, that's to, eat, to eat, and, and will come forth and serve them. In verse 38 says, And if he, or excuse me, if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. Now verse 39 Luke chapter 12, verse 39 says, And this know, that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. And now verse 40. Here's the conclusion. Jesus says, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man comes at an hour when ye think not. <sighs> The Son of God is coming, he says, at a time where, you, where you're not thinking about it. So we need to be watchful. That is a very, very important, very important aspect of safeguarding our stewardship. Watchfulness overcomes carelessness in the way we handle our daily affairs. We need to be watchful. You see, the Lord is going to call at any moment to take us home to glory. I'm not being pessimistic. I'm not being negative. It's just a reality. Eventually, the Lord will call us home. And that's going to be a glorious day. Amen. We're going to go and we're going to be in, you know, before his presence. That's awesome. But at the same time, we need to give an account. Living with that truth in mind will help us avoid foolish decisions. Look at Revelations chapter 22 
and verse 20. Revelations 22 and verse 20, he said, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That should be an atti our, our attitude. To be watchful. That's a watchful person. And then 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. He said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear that we shall be, or what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. You see, so if you're really, really, truly waiting and watching, you want to be pure because he is pure. You want to be ready to receive him. Amen? It's like, folks, tell me if it's not true. Whenever you have an activity going on, whatever it might be, you are anxiously looking forward, right? I mean, you're planning this. You know, if you're going on a trip or something of some sort, I mean, if you're going up north and it's, and it's snowing, then you prepare your, your, your you know, proper clothing for that. If, if, if on, the, on the country you're going to the beaches, you know, you're preparing, you mentally prepare. What do I need? What do I need to wear? Uh, what type of food can we eat? Do I need to take cash? Am I going to take, you know, do I have money in the bank? Is the car all gassed up? Uh, are we flying there? Do we need to be there on time? Do I have, you know what I'm saying? Like we prepare. We anxiously are, are looking forward to, to that activity, wherever, whatever it might be. So imagine the Lord Jesus Christ said he's coming for us. We need to be watchful. We need to be anxiously waiting and prepared. We want to make sure that we're dressed properly. By that I mean be pure, stay pure. Do not contaminate. You don't, you don't want to... Imagine you're flying. You're going out somewhere. And then last minute you start, I don't know, changing the oil in your car with a nice pair of jeans. That's something a guy would do, of course, right? And, and no. First of all, that's not the time to do that. You don't even need the car. You're going to the airport and you're going to get a driver to take you or something. You know, so that's completely out of time. And, and no. And you're going to mess up your clothes. You're going to be, you know, dirty hands and stuff. You don't want to go in the airport and on a nice vacation and stuff like that. Think about that. We don't do those things, do we? I mean, some of us do, but okay. In, in the good world, we, we don't do that kind of stuff. If we, if we followed our wife's uh, advice, we wouldn't do that kind of stuff, guys. But all seriousness, we, we prepare. So how much the more... Should we prepare and be watchful with the Lord's second coming? Folks, th th this will be the call to accounting for stewardship of God's resources. Every one of us will stand before him and will give an account of our stewardship. And I'm not trying to scare you. That should be a time that we look forward to because we're going to be rewarded. Amen. It's a time of rewards, recognition. He's looking for faithfulness from us. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'll finish with this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. He said, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So look at it as this. We're going to graduate from this life so we can move on and go to heaven. And there's going to be a graduation ceremony. And one, what, what is that? One of the things that is most looked forward to on a graduation ceremony, isn't it the, the award ceremony? It's amazing. It's awesome. And, 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 and when an award ceremony has been well planned and stuff, and they have all these different categories and stuff, it's very exciting. I love it. And then you hear the recognition, and, and there's always that one student, right, that gets them all. It's like, oh, my gosh. And then they call this kid or this student, like, 25 times, right? It's awesome. That means that that, that person did what they, re, you know, what, more than they were required. But folks, he says that there's one thing that is required of us as stewards, and that is faithfulness. Faithfulness. 
So watchfulness will protect our stewardship perspective of life. So remember, fear God, be content, trust God, be watchful. Folks, these will protect us from drifting away in this matter of stewardship. Fear God, be content, trust God, be watchful. Today, we need to readjust our stewardship perspective, don't we? Don't you agree? I think we need to adjust or readjust our, our stewardship perspective. Let's settle that with the Lord today, amen? That's my invitation, that's my challenge today. If there's anything that you need to readjust, ask the Lord, Lord, guide me and direct me. Use your word. I've, I've, we've studied dozens, if not already a couple hundred verses of scripture in these last few weeks. Probably well, well over a couple hundred Bible, Bible verses, I'm sure. So the, the, the material is there. The question is, is our heart there? Are we ready to make the move? I pray that, that you will make the move as well if you're watching this video and the folks here, that we will make the right move to readjust our stewardship perspective. Because I, I believe that, that stewardship is a very, very important, a vital part of our Christian life today. God bless you.